Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. There's an ancient Chinese curse which says, may you live in interesting times. One of my favorite commentators has said, his name is Leon Cass, I'm partial to the first name. The ancient Chinese curse seems to have landed on us. We whose lives have spanned the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the new millennium. We are walking through interesting times. And that gives us pause and concern in the way in which we live. Most of us desire to live what St. Paul calls at the very beginning of chapter 4 in Ephesians, a worthy life, a life of meaning, a life that counts, and a life that makes sense. But in a world where we are confused by what that life looks like, what its norms and its values are, we are increasingly skeptical that a worthy life is possible. Ours is an age, says Leon Cass, of atomic power, but also of nuclear proliferation, of globalized trade, but also worldwide terrorism, of instant communication, but also fragmented communities of free association but marital failure, of limitless mobility but a homogenized destination, of open border but of confused identities, of astounding medical advances but also of greater worries about our health, of longer and more vigorous lives but also of protracted, miserable deaths, of unprecedented freedom and prosperity, but also remarkable anxiety about our future, both personal and public. In our heightened age of expectations, oh, we have great expectations. Many Americans fear that their children's lives will be less free. A fear that is shared by the young people themselves. Like their forebears, our youth still harbor a desire for a worthy life. They still hope to find meaning in their lives. They still seek to make sense of life but they, like we all, are increasingly confused about what a worthy life might look like and about how we might be able to live that life. So what do you think? Do you want some boredom, some less interesting times? Sometimes, I think in everyday life, the really good day is when I can say, Gee, nothing happened today. This was a great day. What is our confidence in our family, in our work, in our relationships? Do we want something really interesting and then more confusion with it? Are we confident that the wave of the future is really all that great just because things are going to get more efficient and things are going to get more and more convenient? Is that exciting you today? New gadgets, new gizmos, is that what really brings us here today? We are at a loss about what it means to say something is good beautiful and true. 
But I, like you, are here because of the love of God that builds us up. It is the love of Jesus Christ that builds the church. He is the foundation, his cross. He is the Lamb of God. Often the most prominent symbol in the church is the Lamb of God. It's certainly prominent throughout the Bible. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There is no food in this world to feed us for these interesting times, unless it be the bread that God gives, the bread of life. There is no food without sacrifice, and that's why the cross is the reason that Jesus is the bread of life. Even the food that we get, as our intro for today says, that's the basis for the eyes of all look to you, O Lord, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. God is involved providing the sacrifice. We think of the farmers who sacrifice to give us food. We think of even the animals that sacrifice. There must be sacrifice for us to be fed. And that's why in every important journey in the Bible, sacrifice is God's sacrifice. So we walk in a journey of life in our family, back there in the back row right now, we are anxiously awaiting the first step of Finley Marie, our granddaughter. And it's coming, walking. We take walking for granted. We take the journey through life for granted. If you've ever known somebody who can't walk or is trying to learn how to walk again, you know how hard that is. I think of Yitzhak Perlman, who could not walk without great assistance, but oh, what music he could produce. Walking is not necessarily merely a physical act. It's an act of the whole being. It's what the Bible talks about, is we walk with God, and God walks with us. Every day matters matter. How you and I walk. That's why Ephesians is our lesson today. The first three chapters tell us you learned Christ. That's what Paul says in our lesson very briefly. You learned Christ. You know the love of Christ. Now, therefore, be what you already are. It's the, this is what it is because of what God has done for you. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not a work lest any of us should boast. It's the free gift of God. Now, walk in the strength that the Lord has given you. Just as Elijah got up and went 40 days on the journey, like Israel, in the food that God had provided. I enjoy walking around Skyview Lake it's amazing how you can, even with diminished eyesight, see somebody across the lake and I say, oh, I think I know who that is, just by how they walk. You can tell many things, therapists and doctors tell us, they can tell something about our health, maybe even diagnose a problem that we have based on how we walk. And so it is in our spiritual and moral life. Christ. We have learned Christ. Now we walk with Christ and in Christ. It is no different in our moral life. And believe it or not, people recognize us. 
how we walk, whether we walk the talk that we as Christians have. Everyday life, I'm not talking that you have to become a hero. In fact, probably very few of us will ever become a hero of the faith. But we can be imitators of God as beloved children. We can no longer walk as the world walks. Remember, there was a huge difference between the Gentiles and the Jewish people. The manner of life was noticeable, and people knew the difference. They had a special food. They had special festivals. They had promises that they claimed as the reason for their life. They had directives, and they had direction because of what God had done for them. So St. Paul tells us today, these things that every day of our lives we experience, forgive as you've been forgiven. There you go. That's one for every day. Speak the truth. Yes, even the tough truth in love, whether it's to your parents or to your child or to your grandparent or a fellow member of the church. We don't tell lies to one another. We tell the truth. Boy, is that in short supply around the world right now. So if you want to stick out, I suggest you try telling the truth. We don't steal at work, at home, or in the community. We work honestly in order to share, not to be greedy, as the lesson says, not to give me, 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 more, 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 more. No, but to share with the poor. This congregation does that well. We, this is a congregation that reaches out through good neighbors and other programs, and those are really good. Speak well of each other, says St. Paul. Speak so well of one another that it reminds people of you speaking the words of the Holy Spirit. Not bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander. Switch a channel and see whether you can find one without that. No, we are to channel the speech that comes through the word of God. And finally, imitate God, because God is love, and God's Spirit inhabits us and occupies us. So be what you already are. That's the message that encapsulates the good news of salvation, of the cross and the resurrection, the sacrifice that is food for the whole world. Yes, the body and blood of Christ. As we shared the sacrament last night, one person who was a, a guest said that he was hungry for that kind of food. So I'm going to visit with him this week. We live, as Leon Cass has written in his book, The Hungry Soul. He has written about the world is hungry for something that is meaningful and sustains for the journey of life. So St. Paul comes at this lesson, not with a bunch of pounding rules, not thumbing his fist, do this because I say so, but he appeals to the presence, the reality of the Holy Spirit. God is present in this place. This is a temple of the Holy Spirit. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. You heard the forgiveness of sins today. You come here to receive the body and blood of Christ so that you can walk with the Lord. So the Holy Spirit comes. One of the things I've learned is that God isn't finished with anybody yet. God isn't finished with Mount Olive. 
He's got a great plan for you, a, a great future. He will feed you the manna that you need, just as he gave that spiritual food to Elijah, to all the prophets. You have the Spirit, and so you can bear the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. Let it roll out of us. But you don't have to go far away to do that. You can do that in your vocation. You can do that in your home. You can do that in the process of leading up to Pastor Weist coming. And let's do it in a way in which we have a sense of wonder and awe about it all. Can you imagine what Elijah must have thought? Wow, I haven't eaten in a long time, and I'm still going good. Have you ever been able to do that? It's kind of a joyful fasting, be able to have the food that God gives. There's one passage in the Bible that is a mystery to me, and when I get to heaven, I definitely want to ask Moses about it. It's from Genesis 5. It says in Genesis 5 that Enoch walked with God, and God took him. He didn't die. Anybody think of the other person in the Bible that didn't die? Elijah? Yeah. Taken up. We don't know where Moses was buried. But this is always interesting. I've learned to settle for the answer that comes in the New Testament in Hebrews that just says, God was pleased with Enoch. You see, God is pleased. God gets tickled pink when he sees you walking in the spirit of Jesus. When he sees you walking in a way that is sacrificial in love to others, whether it's poor or rich, you don't distinguish. When he, God can see you offering yourself as a living sacrifice without any concern for self, but freely for the glory of God. God takes that from us as a gift. Hebrews says that was faith. Enoch walked with God, and he's an example of faith, living before the covenant of Noah and Moses. Enoch already participated in the promise of God's occupying spirit that pointed ahead to Jesus, who walked on this earth for you and for me. So walk in the spirit. Luther said the same thing. He said, walk and realize that the best thing about it is the journey. We're not there yet. Luther said this, this life is not godliness, but the process of becoming godly. Not health, but getting well. Not being, but becoming. Not rest, but exercise. We are now not what we shall be, but we are on the way. The process is not yet finished, but it's actively going on. This is not the goal, but it is the right road. At the present, everything doesn't gleam and sparkle. No, not yet, but everything is being cleansed. And by God's grace, dear friends, that is true. Amen.